And I'm really pleased that you're celebrating the 10th anniversary in London, which is BP's hometown. And I believe it is one of the great cities of the world, maybe the greatest city in the world. You'll have your own opinions, but I think it's fabulous. And that's one good reason for BP to offer our support this year. It's not the main reason, though. I think the bigger reason is that we believe this event really matters. We have people from around the world that have come, not only from BP, scholars who have come from 30 countries. And we need leaders who are responsible, they're effective, and with the vision to create a much better world. That's what One Young World does, and that's what it's all about. I saw it myself last year at The Hague. How many of you were in The Hague last year? Great, is that all right? Terrific. Another great city of the world. That's why I wanted to come back this year. And once again, I am bowled over by the atmosphere. Last night was so much fun. I can't decide which was better. I think it was last night, I don't know, but it was fantastic. 191 flags. I thought I knew a lot of flags. There were a lot of flags I'd not seen before. <laughs> but I'm bowled over by your sense of purpose and by that same inspiring energy. The world needs that because there's a change happening out there. And that's not always for the better. Uh, I think the world has grown more polarized. It's more divided. Perhaps you've noticed that. You can see that in London, but also in many cities around the world and on the news. So as I was preparing for today, I was thinking about how we could turn that around a little bit in our own way and focus minds on what's at stake here. I thought we could try to do that today. So this morning, I would like to introduce you to a man who leads one of the most important teams in BP. He's a guy named Spencer Dale. He used to be the chief economist at the Bank of England, where he was thoughtful about the country's finances. And if you want to just check what the Bank of England does, if you have these little papers, pieces of paper in London with a picture of the Queen, it says Bank of England on it. Now he's BP's chief economist, where he's just as thoughtful about the world's energy needs. And he's applying his skills to one of the big problems the world faces today, climate change. So Spencer not only understands the problem, but he's got a very creative way of talking about it. In fact, he's launched his own web series called Energy Illustrated. He's not the great drawer, but he's got some great illustrators. And he brings everything back to the numbers. I didn't realize everybody was over here. So I've asked Spencer if he can come and do exactly that for us today, which is bring the numbers about climate change to life and, ha and have some fun. It's Energy Illustrated Live. So Spencer's giving, going to give us a show. Together, uh, we can create and change how the world's needs change. So Spencer, please come up. I don't know where you are. You're behind these things somewhere. But, uh, there he is. <laughs> what are you doing? Spencer Dale. Good, uh, good morning, um, everyone. It's a real pleasure um, uh, to be here. In case you haven't guessed, One Young World is a big deal for BP. As you just heard, Bob is a massive fan. Many of my friends and colleagues have been delegates in the past and, and raved about it. So I've heard lots about One Young World. But being here, experiencing the energy and enthusiasm firsthand is really quite something. So um, thank you all for making this such an amazing event. This is fantastic. But I'm now going to let you into a secret. I am feeling really nervous right now. OK, so we all agree, I'm sure, that climate change is real. The scientific evidence is overwhelming. And I'm sure you also agree that the pace of progress in tackling this threat is nowhere near enough. Carbon emissions accelerated last year. They grew at their fastest rate for seven or eight years. Today and tomorrow, you'll hear many reminders of the potentially damaging effects of climate change and the collective failure of the world's response so far. These concerns are real. The world is on an unsustainable path, 
And that path, if left unchecked, could have hugely harmful implications for our planet and for all of us living on it. But hang on, I'm chief economist of BP, one of the world's largest oil and gas companies. What's BP doing here? Aren't we part of the problem? Now, I truly believe we're not. Trust me, we want to live, I want to live, in a sustainable, orderly world, just as much as you all do. And companies like BP can be, and indeed need to be, part of the solution. But I can understand why some of you may be a little bit skeptical about that, which is why I'm really nervous. Okay. Now, there's a saying in the UK that a problem shared is a problem halved. So in that spirit, I brought two friends along for support, Samang and Callum. Come on out, guys. This is Samang and Callum. I want to give a welcome. <laughs> yeah. Now, as Bob mentioned, the three of us recently have made a series of short videos called Energy Illustrated, in which I briefly describe an issue from the world of energy, and then Samang and Callum do the hard work illustrating that um, issue, bringing it um, to life. Now, the good thing about the videos is that although they only last a few minutes, and if you have time, please do check them out. We're always in the key for, for new subscribers, Energy Illustrated on their web. Um, they only take a few minutes to watch, but they take hours to film. And so Samang and Callum have plenty of time to perfect their illustrations. You'll see they're quite perfectionists. Today, for the first time ever, they're going to do their illustrations live, in real time. So when I spoke to Samang and Callum about this, they were even more nervous than I was. So we invited a few of their friends along as well. Come on out, guys. We're really sharing our problems today, OK? <laughs> so over the next 10 minutes, as, I, as the illustrators get to work, I want to highlight some of the economic dimensions of, climate, of global warming. And at the end, we can then turn around and see what the team have come up with. So good luck, guys. No pressure. Nobody watching. It'll all be fine. OK. <laughs> I want to explore three issues in particular. First. As well as less carbon, the future being of our world also requires more energy. So the world faces a dual challenge, the need for more energy and less carbon. Second, although continued rapid growth in renewable energy would be vital in meeting this challenge, it's unlikely to be enough. There are no silver bullets. And finally, we can't rely on someone else to solve the, this challenge. It's down to us. So point one, the need for more energy. Today, over 800 million people in the world don't have access to electricity. Imagine going back to your homes or your hotels tonight and not being able to turn on your lights. Or your children or loved ones not being able to do their homework at night. Even more shocking, almost 3 billion people, that's over a third of the world's population, don't have access to clean cooking facilities. The UN estimate that 4 million people will die prematurely this year due to the use of unclean cooking fuels. And what we've done at BP suggests that 80% of the world's population today live in countries where energy consumption is so low that increases in energy tend to go hand in hand with significant improvements in human development. The world needs more energy to grow and prosper. Access to safe, secure, affordable energy enriches lives. It's imperative that those of us fortunate enough to have energy remember those that don't. The haves mustn't forget the have-nots the role of renewable energy, by which I mean wind, solar, and biofuels. 
As defined, renewables are likely to be the fastest growing source of energy over the next 20 years penetrating the global energy system more quickly than any fuel ever seen in history. The future for renewables is extraordinarily bright. But renewables can't provide all of the world's energy needs. And again, there's an important distinction here between the haves and the have-nots. In much of the rich, developed world, energy demand is flat or falling. We have enough cars, TVs, air conditioning units, and as the efficiency of appliances and businesses' processes improves, our need for energy will fall. In these countries, rapid growth in renewables can play a central role in decarbonizing the energy system. Each new jewel of renewable energy can displace existing coal, oil, or natural gas, reducing carbon emissions. But that's not the case in fast-growing developing economies, where increasing prosperity and access to energy is driving a rapid expansion in energy demand. In those countries, renewables on their own simply can't keep up. In China last year, renewable energy grew by over 25%. The same in India, over 25% extraordinary growth. But in both those countries, that rapid growth in renewable energy was not enough to even match the growth in electricity demand, let alone displace existing fuels. And so as a result, coal consumption in both China and India increased last year. Continued rapid growth in renewable energy is critical for our future welfare, but it just simply won't be sufficient to meet the world's growing energy needs. To meet those needs while still ensuring carbon emissions are falling will require a range of fuels and technologies. So alongside rapid growth in renewables, we need to see inc increased switching from the use of coal to natural gas. Increasing the use of technologies that capture carbon emissions at their points of use and then store them safely underground. So-called CCUS, carbon capture, use and storage. And importantly, here in the West, improving energy efficiency, allowing energy be, to be used by those who need it most, by the have-nots. The final point I want to emphasize is the importance of all of us playing our role in addressing climate change and the dual challenge. These are not someone else's problems to solve, they're our problems to solve. If you stand back a moment and just think about it for a moment, climate change has two sort of key features. It's long-term and it's global, okay? If you think about climate change, long-term and global. These features make it particularly hard to solve for two reasons. First, the nature of our electoral system means the vast majority of politicians are short-term and local. So we have short-term local politicians solving a massive long-term global problem. That's not a criticism, it's just a fact. Second, and I think even more importantly, it's hard to worry about global well-being in the future if you're worrying about your family's well-being today. Remember, 800 million people without access to electricity. 3 billion people using the harmful fuels to cook their families' meals tonight. Haves and have-nots. Now, this is not meant as a counsel of despair that it's all too difficult. Far from it. It's a call to arms. Climate change needs to be solved and can be solved, but we can't leave it for someone else to fix. It will take all of us to do it. Yes, there's a vital role for government, but governments can't solve this on their own. Remember, short-term local, long-term global. Big oil and gas companies like BP need to play their role, using their engineering expertise and financial strength to bring cleaner energy to those who need it most. And BP are committed to doing so, growing their renewables and other low-carbon businesses. But they can't get ahead of government policies and society's preferences. It's hard to sell energy if nobody wants to buy that type of energy. There's an onus on all of us 
as citizens of the world, to play our role. We must take responsibility for our own actions. Carbon efficiency starts at home. We must support and pressure our governments to think long-term and globally. We must be suspicious of claims of wonder cures and silver bullets. Remember, renewables can't do this all on their own. The world will need many types of energy for many years to come. For that reason, we need to encourage cooperation, not polarization. Demands for bans and divestments of certain fuels are misguided and potentially harmful, especially to those who are most in need of energy, the have-nots. And in that vein, and perhaps most importantly of all, the haves must remember the have-nots. Okay, now that were my three points I wanted to talk about. Far more interesting is how the team got on in terms of doing this live in real time. How did you get on, guys? Samantha Callum, how did it go? <laughs> Bob, why don't you come up and see what you think? I think it's a fantastic group. Bob, what do you think? Oh, my gosh. You guys are talented. They're far more talented than you are about this stuff. It's amazing. <laughs> so I really like this piece here, the way they've sort of brought out the dual mm. challenge, this sort of need for more energy, mm. but also fewer emissions, less carbon, mm. so they're bringing out that bit. For me, also, mm. this idea, this wonder cures, which is sort of mm. dominating much of the debate today, that there's something can solve it, and we can throw away lots of other energies. There are no wonder mm. cures. We'll need lots of different types of energies for <clears> many years mm. to come. And for me, perhaps most importantly of all, when we're thinking deeply about how to reduce carbon emissions, let's remember this other side, and the haves have to remember the have-nots. And that, I thought you brought that out very well there. Guys, well done. Nice time. Well done. Thank you. Let me, let me tell you just a story. <clears throat> so Spencer mentioned three billion people who cook with wood chips, cow dung, kerosene, and coal in their homes. Not their kitchens, in their homes. The life expectancy impacted. And I was in India last week talking with the energy minister. And India put a program in just this year that took 60 million people to take LPG to cook in their homes. And he said, not only is it healthier, but he said it saved five hours a day because people would get up in the morning, go get wood or cows, things, and cook. And he said it's changed the lives of so many families. In one year, five hours extra, usually for women, to have free time to either have another job or take care of children and educate it. It was the most inspiring story of how a small thing can impact things. You don't read about these things. So this dual challenge is incredible. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. David. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Great.